Now, with all of this theology we're talking about, what about knowing God and meeting God? Our Muslim friends say God is unknown and unknowable. I was uh, once in a seminar like this, and the uh, presenter put God at the top of the board and us below, and she would put a chalk mark across the board like this. Occasionally, she gave her lecture, this Muslim theologian from Syria, and she said, God is unknown and unknowable. We know his attributes, but we don't know God's essence. We don't meet God. And she put this line across the board until it became really quite thick. How can we know God? How can we? Muslims say, God, we know his will, but God himself does not meet us. Now, within Islam, there is a stream of theology that says, but that's not good enough. We would like to know God. And so they examine the Quran very carefully. And behold, they discover <laughs> that, uh, that Abraham is called a Wali. Wow. Abraham a Wali. What does Wali mean? Friend. Abraham is a Wali of God. Oh, so if Abraham is a Wali of God, then perhaps we can know God. Because friends know each other, don't they? And so that kind of question, is there a way that we can break out of this not knowing God, not experiencing God, and experience Him. And that movement is called Sufi. I better erase that. That didn't get very good there. Sufi. The Sufi movement. The mystics who are seeking to know God. Now, Sufism doesn't only get its inspiration from Abraham, who... Uh, was a friend of God. It also gets its inspiration from Muhammad. Within Islam, there is this account. Within Islam, there is this account of, um, of uh, Muhammad at the time when his wife died, and he's very discouraged there in Mecca. He's not gone to Medina yet. Very discouraged in Mecca. That one night, a horse came from heaven called Burak, and picked Muhammad up there in his bed in Mecca, whisks him all the way over to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem at the spot where the, uh, where the Jewish temple had been built, the Temple of Solomon, at Jerusalem, this horse hits, goes to that rock where the temple had been built, and then ascends into heaven, all the way into the seventh heaven, into the presence of God. This is called the Miraj. Now, there's not much in the Quran about that. It just talks about that, that mysterious night, the Miraj, just refers to it. It's the Hadith, the traditions, which fill in the gaps and explain what happened. And according to the traditions, this is what happened. Muhammad, on his way up to the seventh heaven, uh, meets Moses on the way, he meets Jesus and so forth, and they're doing their salats, Abraham, doing their prayers and whatnot, and uh, he goes on past them and gets into God's presence. And God has instructions for Muhammad on how often Muslims should pray, and I don't have all of this right, how many times and so forth, so I'm just sort of uh, demonstrating what, what, actually, what, what they believe happened. So uh, God says to, to Abraham, uh, to, to, to Muhammad, I want the Muslims to pray 20 times a day. And, uh, and Muhammad says, oh great, that, that, that's, that's no problem, we'll do that. And so he starts down, and uh, he meets uh, Moses on the way down, and Moses says, uh, hey, what did God say? Well, God said that uh, Muslims are to pray 20 times a day. <gasps> what did you say about that? I said, no problem at all. M Mo Moses said, Muhammad, are you crazy? I can't get the Jews to pray three times a day. Three times, we just, uh, you're saying 20 times? You go up and you tell God that's a little bit much. 
And so Muhammad spends a part of the night shuffling back and forth between uh, Moses and, uh, and God there in the seventh heaven um, until they got it negotiated down to five times a day. And uh, Moses says, I'm telling you, Muhammad, that's too much. Muhammad says, the Muslims will do better than the Jews in praying. They will do, they'll, 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 they'll pray um, uh, five times a day. And so he comes down to that rock. If you ever get to Jerusalem and you go into the Dome of the Rock Mosque, you will see in the big rock upon which that mosque is built a little indentation, which Muslims say, a little indentation like that, which they say is where the hoof of the horse hit down when it came down from the seventh heaven. And then this horse whisks him back to his home, and when he gets awake in the morning, he is in his bed. So all of that took place uh, during his, during, during his um, repose one night. Now, why am I talking about that? Because it's not only Abraham who is a wali of God. It is also Muhammad who got into God's presence, you see. And so this notion that there is a kind of impenetrable barrier between God and us, the Abraham story and the Muhammad story give Moses hope that maybe a way can be found to get into the presence, of, to experience God. And that's the Sufi quest. That's the Sufi quest. And there's various ways in which they work at that quest. But the preeminent way is by finding intercessors. Intercessors. The intercessors are people who are very holy and very pious and who have, are descended from Muhammad and who have, who have received from Muhammad inner spiritual understandings and insights which enable them to move into God's presence just as Muhammad moved into God's presence. So Muhammad is like the, the pathfinder. Uh, he, is, he is the forerunner of this community who are able to move into God's presence and to uh, experience God. They have all kinds of worship techniques and so forth, but it's all linked to this idea of the miraj in which Muhammad is, finds himself scooting up there to the seventh heaven uh, back there so many, many years ago. Now, there's, again, a huge debate among Muslims about that because the Quran says there is no intercessor between God and man. Yet, the Sufis are looking for an intercessor and, uh, and they think, they, they, think they, have, uh, they have found their intercessor in Muhammad even though the Quran says no intercessor. Oh, but then when you look at the Quran very carefully, it says no intercessor unless God has appointed the intercessor. Also, they say, we hope that God has appointed Muhammad as the intercessor. That's our hope. That's our hope, you see. And so the Sufis will gather together regularly for their prayers and so forth. When we lived in Nairobi, uh, there was a Sufi mosque right across the... Um, street from where we lived. And every Thursday night, they would have their, their prayers, which was really chants. Um, and they would name the name of Muhammad over and over again. And another saint called Abdukader al-Jilani, who uh, they said was uh, a very good friend, of, very closely associated spiritually with Muhammad, that he got inner spiritual insights from Muhammad. And so uh, in their, in their uh, prayers, they would repeat the name of God over and over again, and then the names of these, of these saints. Allahu, 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 Allahu. Abdukadr al-Jilani, Abdukadr al-Jilani, Abdukadr al-Jilani, Abdukadr al-Jilani, saying the name over and over again, you know, and then the name of Muhammad over and over again, you see. As they hope by repeating these names over and over again, why uh, they would somehow become absorbed into God and, be, and experience God. That's, that's what they were reaching for. And when they become absorbed into God, then they trust that that absorption will give them blessing and power and strength. That's what they're hoping for, special kinds of blessing. I remember uh, when I lived in Somalia going on a pilgrimage uh, with Muslims to the shrine of one of their saints, who they said uh, was a very holy man, he could do miracles, and that they believed he was... Uh, 
that he is right at the door of Muhammad now, and Muhammad is at the door of God. And so we went to this shrine, and they would put their prayers on the branches of the trees and so forth, and then they would um, and then uh, go back to the village and have a feast and whatnot, and uh, explaining to me that we're sinful, and therefore God does not hear our prayers, uh, we feel. And so uh, uh, by taking this pilgrimage and by reciting the name of uh, our saint and of Abdelkader al-Jalani and of Muhammad, we hope that our prayers will be taken into the door of God. And I said, is this good Islam? Well, they said, actually, it's not good Islam. But we hope that these people have been appointed intercessors. That's our hope. And in my response, I said, uh, may I just make a comment? I said that in the Bible we read that there is an intercessor whom God has, God has uh, appointed. And the intercessor is Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah. And so I read, I read to them a portion here from, um, from, um, from Hebrews, book of Hebrews in the Bible, which is a wonderful, wonderful book for Sufis. There we go, yeah. Uh, uh, looking at Hebrews chapter 7, and we'll look at, uh, at, verse, uh, at verse 20 there. That God says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are priests forever, because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. That Jesus has been appointed priest forever. God has named him. And so in my conversation, when I was on that uh, trek with these Muslims, I pointed out, I can understand why you're a bit uneasy about this thing of intercessors and so forth, you know. It's because God has appointed the Messiah as the eternal intercessor. And uh, that's why Christians, see this is very helpful, that's why Christians pray in the name of Jesus the Messiah, because he has been appointed the intercessor. Muslims often ask us that question. Why do you pray in the name of Jesus? He has been appointed. In fact, we read here that God has sworn and will never change his mind. The Messiah is appointed intercessor forever. Now, why does God appoint the Messiah as intercessor? Well, it's because of several reasons. One is he is sinless. Another is he participates in our life fully. He understands what we're experiencing fully. Another is that he died for our sins. And another is that he resurrected from the dead. He is a living intercessor. Another is that he is in God's presence, interceding for us. That the character and, and, and life and ministry of Jesus all qualify him in a marvelous way to be the eternal intercessor. And God has appointed him and will never change his mind this Jesus, the Messiah, is the eternal intercessor. That's good news for Sufis. Uh, on that pilgrimage, as I walked through this story of Jesus being appointed the intercessor, the Muslims with me would keep saying, oh, wow, that's, that's really amazing. <laughs> oh, they were really quite, quite impressed. Jesus appointed the eternal intercessor. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. As we've been looking at Islam, we see a great concern about submitting to the will of God. And the whole Sharia system and the Hadith system has to do with that, submitting to God's instruction in every detail. Within the Christian movement, um, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, a Muslim once told me that you Christians have the Holy Spirit, so you don't have to memorize the whole Bible. We Muslims don't know about the Holy Spirit, and so we need to memorize the Quran. Um, the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, is the law of God within our souls, uh, enabling us and empowering us to live righteously and joyously in accordance with the teachings and model of Jesus. Uh, not how he brushed his teeth, but how he lived um, his life. And uh, Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. I just want to leave this as a wrap-up statement as we uh, conclude our discussion of Islam, where Jesus says to his disciples, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things. The promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Very precious promise. Now, within the Muslim movement, there are those who say uh, that these uh, promises within 
John 14 and 16 about the coming of, coming of the Holy Spirit is really about the coming of Muhammad, that this is what it's about. And uh, we don't have time in this class to go into the reason why they say that, but I would just like to say very clearly and very forthrightly, Jesus is, pr is promising the coming of the Holy Spirit here, not the promise about another prophet. Uh, this is a promise about the coming of the Holy Spirit, who is a very precious gift, and it's through the Holy Spirit that we are empowered and enabled to know the truth. And so we should not in any way disparage the ministry of the Holy Spirit, very precious gift, whom we should treasure.